Whilst here on FM now, we begin a new book of the week. Ricky Tomlinson, one of the country's best-loved comic actors, reads from his recent autobiography, Ricky, charting the circuitous route by which he came to be a household name. Today, Ricky tells some colourful and uncompromising stories of his childhood and teenage years in Liverpool. Adolf Hitler did his best to overshadow my arrival. There I was, snug and cosy, with nothing better to do than head foot man's bladder five times a night, when he decided to invade Poland. It's amazing what some people will do to compensate for only having one ball. Peggy Tomlinson was nine months pregnant when she evacuated from Liverpool in case of the bombing. Mum left behind my brother, Albert, aged two, and my dad, who had a priority job as a baker, and couldn't go with her. I was born at a place called Bailey House in Bispham, Blackpool, on the 26th of September, 1939. I was a big lump, nine and a half pounds, with blonde, very curly hair that was so fine, people used to think I was bald. Mam had me christened Eric, but only a handful of people have ever called me that. To everyone else, I was Rick. Mam stayed in Blackpool for three days before she packed her things, ignored the warnings, and went back to Liverpool. We're all in this together, she told Dad, as she crisscrossed the windows with sticky tape and dyed flower sacks to make blackout curtains. Despite my size of birth, I proved to be a sickly little bastard going back and forth to hospital for failing to thrive. Eventually, they discovered that I had asthma. The doctors gave me exercises to develop my lungs. Dad would put a blanket over our little square dining table and put a table tennis ball in the centre. Come on, Rick, blow the ball off the table, he'd say, handing me a drinking straw. They talked about sending me away to a convalescent home over the water in the Whittle, where the air was less polluted, but I suspect they couldn't afford to. I have been asthmatic all my life, but I have no regrets about growing up in an industrial city. Clean air is no substitute for a family. I spent my first 17 years at 37 Land Street, a two-up, two-down terrace house about three-quarters of a mile from Liverpool's football ground. There were two bedrooms upstairs. Mum and Dad had the front room overlooking the street, while Albert and me shared a double bed in the back room. Our David came along 18 months later, and Ronnie didn't arrive until 1948, when I was almost nine. Downstairs, at the back of the house, was the kitchen, the heart of the house. The front room was known as the parlour, or the best room, with a three-piece suite, a sideboard, and a radiogram. It was reserved for visitors and special occasions like Christmas. The toilet was outside in the small rear yard, which meant to trek by candlelight at night and ripping off squares of the Liverpool Echo. Once a week on Saturday night, the bungalow bath was taken off the wall outside and placed in front of the fire, and we took turns. Mam scrubbed us with dayback soap, which killed anything in our hair, and combed it for nits with a horrible metal tooth comb that left tram lines in your scalp. Ow, Mam! No! You're hating! I'm not having people talking about me. A letter from the nit nurse was the cause of great shame. My dad, Albert Edward Tomlinson, looked a bit like George Raft, the big Hollywood star of the 30s. Slightly built, with dark eyes and black hair slicked back with a comb, he was a snappy dresser and a good dancer. For 27 years, from the age of 14, he worked nights as a baker. Don't make a noise, your dad's in bed, Mam would warn us during the day. And then, at about seven each evening, she'd say, give your dad a shout. It's time for his tea. He woke, and I watched him strip down to his old-fashioned white vest. He had to wash in a basin of cold water and put on his work clothes. Downstairs, Mam had set a plate of chips and an egg on the table, alongside a copy of the Liverpool Echo. We lads hovered around him like gulls, scavenging chips. 
Mum used to scold him for feeding us, but my dad ate virtually nothing. If the tea was too hot and he was running late, Dad poured it into his saucer and slurped it up. Mum went bonkers. She liked to think we were a bit better than that. I loved my dad. I loved him when I didn't even know what the word meant. I used to get excited waiting for him to come home. I would see him coming or I'd hear the latch lift on the back door. Then I'd bury my head under his arm which smelled of flour and warm bread. No one was rich and no one was poor in Land Street. We were all in the same leaky boat, struggling to make ends meet. With a husband and three kids to look after, Mam couldn't afford to stop working. She was cleaning two pubs and working in a wash house. Everyone knew everyone in Land Street. There were around 60 houses and most had children. In the long twilights we played catch and chase games on the streets like Tick and Alalio. By far the most terrifying game we played was along the entries which ran between the houses. The passages were three foot wide, flanked by high brick walls, slick with moss. It was a test of bravery to balance on one wall and then hurl yourself across the gap, hopefully landing on the other side on your stomach. We call this belly banding. One of my favourite tricks was to tie black cotton to a door knocker in the street and then trail us across the road to a hiding place in one of the entries. I tugged the cotton. Knock, knock. Mrs Stringer, a 50s version of Hyacinth Bouquet, opened the door, looked up and down the street, and then closed it again. I waited half a second. Knock, knock. The trick was to see how many times I could do it before she caught on and snapped the cotton. No matter what door I targeted or how well I hid, the reaction was always the same. I know it's you, Ricky Tomo, you little shite. I'm going to tell you, ma'am. My first school, Hayware Street Primary, at the bottom of Land Street, was only 200 yards from home. One particular teacher left a big impression on me because she read stories to us like Black Beauty and Treasure Island. I could picture scenes so vividly that I became lost in these adventures. When I was a little bit older, Mr. Drew, my English teacher, encouraged me to make use of my imagination. Tomlinson, get up and describe that scene, he said, pointing to a picture of the Pampas and the Gauchos in Argentina. I started talking about the bulls and the horsemen, creating a story that had heroes and villains, romance and danger. There were never books around our house, so I joined the library by St. George's Church and used to borrow penny thrillers and comics like the Wizard and Hotspur. My other escape was the cinema, where it cost only a couple of coppers to go to a Saturday matinee at the Everton Picture Palace. That's how I discovered the old Mother Riley films. Arthur Lucan would dress up in a frock and play old Mother Riley, a gossipy Irish washerwoman. I laughed until tears ran down my cheeks. Inspired by these films, I convinced a mate of mine, Davy Steele, that we should put on a show for the neighbourhood kids and charge them a penny at the door. I donned one of Mam's old frocks and did my own version of Old Mother Riley. This was my first experience of acting, unless you count trying to con my little brother into doing chores for me. Apart from my dad, all the heroes of my youth were football players. My all-time favourite was Billy Liddle, who played outside left for Liverpool. He could run like the wind and hit a ball from anywhere. I went to Anfield almost from the time I could walk riding on Dad's shoulders through the sea of red. If he couldn't afford the shilling, he used to lift me over the turnstile and only pay for himself. There was a real buzz in the air before the big games, and we all wore scarves and red rosettes on our coats with big wooden rattles that spun into a deafening roar. Sport played a big part in our lives. During the winter, on the dark nights as we call them, Albert and me would go to St Saviour's Boys Club to box, play table tennis and have relay races. I was built like a whippet and could run like the wind, but they stopped me boxing when they discovered I had asthma. At least they let me play football. There was no such thing as a friendly football game. Even playing in Lancet with a couple of coaches' goals, when you took a penalty, it was the equivalent of taking one for England. Everything stopped. Adults stood in doorways or stopped everything to watch. 
Who do you think you are? Billy Little? Women would shout. This fierce competitive streak has never left me. One summer in the early 1950s, I went on holiday with the church to Great Hucklow in Wales, with kids from all over the place. We stayed in Nissen huts with bunks down either side and had to fill our own mattresses with straw. If I were to pinpoint a single moment when I began to notice girls, it would be on this holiday. Who had the nicest curves? Who had the prettiest smile? Up till then, I knew they were different, but only because they smelled nicer and didn't fight so much. My entire life changed. I had a mission. The nightly games in Lance Street reflected this. Suddenly, the aim was to catch a girl and kiss her, instead of running the other way. We didn't have dates as such. Instead, we found a dark corner and hoped to steal a kiss, or perhaps a little bit more. That's when I made my next important discovery. The other lads were trying to impress the girls by boasting or fighting. But I had more success making them laugh and feel good about themselves. I told them how pretty they looked and how nice they smelled. Most of these girls weren't used to being complimented because it had never happened before. I was still only young, maybe 11 or 12. But that didn't stop me. I adored girls. They were the gear. I couldn't sleep, eat or work without thinking about them. There must have been 20 who lived in Land Street, including my mate's sisters. We often arranged to meet at someone's house if their parents were out working. The front door was kept latched and the back door was open in case one of them came home early and we had to make an escape. Turning down the gaslights and closing the curtains, we played games like Truth or Dare and Spin the Bottle. The sexual tension has never been equaled. In those days, an exam called the 13 plus was available to students who they thought should have or could have passed the 11 plus. I passed this exam and was enrolled in Walton Technical College, a short bus ride away. The teacher in the plastering shop was named Adams and was related to a firm of Adams Brothers, a highly regarded plastering firm in Liverpool. Adam's brothers took me on when I turned 16. It meant taking classes at night and working on building sites during the day. I passed my City and Guilds exams at 17, but still had four more years to go before I finished my apprenticeship. Like most lads my age, I didn't think much about the future. Having a good time seemed a good enough ambition. The Grafton, a famous local ballroom, had a Saturday afternoon tea dance and for a shilling you could get a cup of tea, two biscuits and the chance to hold a gale close during the slow numbers. The ballroom era was ending and rock and roll had arrived but the Grafton was slow to embrace the change and the bouncers would drag anyone caught jiving off the dance floor. A proper big band provided the music with bandmasters like Johnny Hilton and support acts such as the Billy Ellis Trio which had a blind piano player and a double bass player with a broken nose. Girls would stand on one side of the dance floor and the boys on the other. No man's land lay in between. The walk back seemed twice as long if a girl refused to dance with you. I had a system. I picked my target and approached at an angle, popping the question while still a few paces away. If she said no, I could simply carry on walking as though heading for the toilet. When rock and roll eventually took over, Satie at the Grafton became jive night. All the guys had hairstyles like Tony Curtis with a DA, duck's arse at the back, and wore button-up Italian suits, draped coats, tight trousers, and beetle crusher shoes. In 1957, Marty Robbins had a hit song called A White Sports Coat and a Pink Carnation. I got myself a white coat and black slacks with black shoes. When I walked into the Grafton, I thought I was the bee's knees. Ricky Tomlinson was reading from his autobiography, Ricky. And tomorrow at the same time, you can hear about Ricky's first career as a plasterer and playing the banjo on the Liverpool club circuit. It's on 92 to 9. BBC Radio 4 FM. And now Ricky Tomlinson, one of the country's best-loved comic actors, continues reading from his recent autobiography, Ricky, charting the circuitous route by which he came to be a household name. 
In today's episode, he trains as a plasterer and plays the banjo on the boisterous Liverpool pub circuit. In 1956, just before my 17th birthday, I was plastering at a pub called Lulu's in Hayward Street. It was owned by a woman who had a mouth like a docker and a husband known as Fat George for obvious reasons. While working in the toilets, I heard a wonderful plink plong plink sound coming from the bar. I put down my tools and went to investigate. A fella sat on a stool in the corner picking at the strings of a banjo. People were soon singing and tapping their feet. That evening, I told me mamma all about it. Mum went looking in second-hand music shops and found a battered old banjo for two quid. I was made up. The lessons with Mrs Scoble cost one and six. Another of Mrs Scoble's students, Wilf Murphy, was about six feet tall with very blonde hair and real musician's fingers and hands. He was a much better banjo player than me. The two of us decided to start a band. We had half a dozen American folk songs and Lonnie Donegan numbers, which proved to be more than enough. To complement the banjos, we recruited two guitarists, Brian Craig and Alan Jennings. We called ourselves the Gitanjos. The motivation for the band had nothing to do with dreams of stardom or wealth. We wanted to pull beards, and in my experience, there was two surefire ways of doing this, being a good dancer or playing in a band. Although I worked during the week, the banjo and the band were much more exciting. Deciding to branch out, we went along to a Sunday afternoon audition at a local club called Aussie Wades. That was when all the concert secretaries from the social clubs and working men's clubs would come along to hear new bands and comics. Each act was given ten minutes. The Gitanjos were hardly what you'd call polished, but we did have a certain style. I came on stage wearing a grass skirt and a bra filled out with rubber balls. Then after singing Lily of Laguna, I told a few gags and bounced the balls on stage. Miraculously, we finished up with six bookings. Our first gig was at Nowsley Labour Club and the audience seemed to like us. I thought I was a real Jack the Lad, playing in pubs and clubs when I couldn't even drink legally. My first real love was a girl called Margie King. I knew it was love because I felt physically sick every time I was apart from her and ten feet tall when I stood next to her. It may be hard to believe, but I was pretty fancy on my feet back then. Margie could dance like an angel and people would clear the dance floor to watch us. Margie was living with her boyfriend Peter and his folks, which made things complicated. One night he was waiting for me. I was sure to get a hiding. It was David versus Goliath. At that moment, even though I hated westerns, I knew exactly how Gary Cooper felt in high noon. He battered me senseless, but at the same time I knew he could have hit me a lot harder and for a lot longer. He landed the last blow, pulled down his sleeves and said, OK, Rick, I'll see you tomorrow. OK, Peter. And that was it. My apprenticeship as a plasterer lasted six years and I loved the camaraderie of the building sites. Adams Brothers handled big contracts like the Manchester Airport Hotel and the Carrington Power Station. In our little gang we had Big Joe Seward, the driver, Barney Snag, who had boxed professionally, Reuben Bennett, the strongest man I ever met in my life, and Georgie Schofield, another ex-boxer who could catch a fly out of the air he was so quick. We worked hard from morning till night, never moaning, and always having a laugh. By the early 60s, the band had a new name, Hobo Rick and the City Slickers. The name Hobo came about because I often arrived late at gigs, still covered in plaster from the building sites. Meanwhile, all the other lads were dressed in red and black striped coats, white shirts, bow ties, and straw boaters. After a while, it became part of my image. The lads were fine about the new name, and whatever few quid we earned was always split equally between the four of us. 
There was nothing very slick or sophisticated about the shows. Anyone could get up and do a spot, and each venue had its own atmosphere and cast of wonderful characters. There were singers, drunks, raconteurs, gigolos, gangsters and joke tellers. The most bizarre performer was the claw, who had this green withered false hand, which he would stick up his sleeve and suddenly produce as he went round collecting the glasses. My favourite was Paddy Moister, the ugliest man in the world. Paddy was a lovely Irishman and a docker who had this incredible mug. You're bloody ugly, I said to him once. Yeah, I know, he replied, but it's only for work. Some of the pubs we played in became as much a part of my life as the houses of my childhood. Places like the Thalemere, the best little pub in Liverpool, where lots of Everton footballers used to drink. Over the road, at a place called the Honky Tonk, there was another rogues gallery of locals, including Jogger Morley, who was five foot nothing and an ex-pro boxer. Jogger had this massive Alsatian that was damn near as big as him, and whenever he ordered a pint of beer, he bought a half of the dog which he poured into a tray. As Jogger walked home one night, a cute little poodle ran out onto the pavement and Jogger gave it a pat. This made the Alsatian jealous and it nipped him on the arse. Jogger turned and punched the dog on the nose, dropping it like a stone. You bastard! I've been drinking with you all night, he said, and this is how you repay me. The Mediterranean pub had a different crowd again. The most memorable was Joe Murray, a mad Everton supporter, who had the best Irish jig at wig I've ever seen in my life. Joe was a businessman, and the police always took a great deal of interest in his activities. He would come into the pub, flush with loot from his latest business deal, and toss money into the air or thrust it into the hands of pensioners. Joe drove this great big American car, which everyone recognised, including the police. Heading home from the Mediterranean one night with a few mates, the police pulled the car over. An officer walked up to his window. Joe wound it down. Been drinking, have you, Mr Murray? Yes, I've had a real good drink tonight. Have you now? More than two pints? Oh, yes, I must have had at least, what, eight or nine pints. Did you have any shorts? A, a few chasers, yeah, you know, a scotch or two. Do you think you're fit to drive home, Mr Murray? Oh, definitely not. I must be way over the limit. The copper was getting really excited about nailing Joe, but couldn't understand why he was so relaxed. I'm a very lucky man, Joe explained. What makes you think you're so lucky? Well, I'm lucky to have a mate who can drive me home. This is an American car, officer, and I'm sitting in the passenger seat. Kicking my way around Liverpool taught me more about people and life than all my years at school. I was happiest in the pub. People knew me. I was Hobo Rick. Nothing else created the same excitement or sense of belonging. The second time I fell in love was at a fairground in Wrexham, North Wales, in 1961. She was a nice-looking girl with bright red hair, great legs and freckles on her nose. Her name was Marlene Clifton and she worked as a machinist in a clothing factory and lived at home with her folks in Queen's Park, Wrexham. They were a smashing family, very working class. We dated for nearly two years. She wouldn't entertain the possibility of sleeping with me unless we were married. I quite respected her for this, but it didn't stop me from trying. I can't remember when we decided to get engaged, but everyone seemed happy. I was 22 years old and become a fully-fledged city and girls plasterer. We married on the 22nd of March, 1962, at a church in Wrexham. Dad hired a minibus to transport the family from Liverpool. Albert was my best man. Instead of a honeymoon, I put down £250 deposit on a parlour house in Salop Street, close to Goodison Park, Everton's home ground. I would rush home from work, excited about seeing her, and drag her upstairs to bed. She giggled and complained about cooking the dinner, but the protests were always pretty hollow. invited me to join them and I told a few gags and sang a song. Soon after that we became known as Hobo Rick and the Hi-Fi Three, with Tommy on vocals, Brian Edwards a docker on bass, and Tony Scoggins, Scoggo, on rhythm guitar. The other lads grew these little Van Dyke beards to enhance their image, but I kept my scruffy beard. 
Apart from playing the banjo and singing a few songs, the rest of the material seemed to happen intuitively, and some of the stuff was fairly blue. One sketch involved a hospital scene, where a woman from the audience pretended to be pregnant. OK, gentlemen, put on your masks. We had Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck masks. Hammer. I was past a huge hammer. Chisel. Saw. Wrench. Until I finished up holding a pneumatic drill. Right. Success at last, I said. We've got our drawers off. Although I was busy, I still managed to drop round to Elmore Street once or twice a week to see Mum and Dad. In 1966, Dad was diagnosed with lung cancer. Dad went downhill very quickly. Even as he deteriorated, I used to love making him laugh. When Albert cut his hair, Dad would say, I love our Rick, but I wouldn't let him near me with a pair of scissors. He knew I'd give him a Mohican. Dad died on February the 28th, 1967. He was 55 years old and had worked all his life. He didn't leave a carrot, not a penny. I still miss him. Hobo Rick and the Hi-Fi 3 played in some pretty rough pubs, places where fellas would tap you on the shoulder with a bar stool if you looked at them twice. The Colombo Club in Seal Street was one of the most notorious clubs. The owner, Tony Gallagher, was a little guy who used to be a boxer. He asked us to do a few gigs of a Sunday. The Colombo was always full of gangsters, con men, hustlers, crooked lawyers, ex-boxers and hard cases. The only girls I saw there were mistresses or prostitutes who worked the ships. After getting to know the regulars, I was soon telling jokes about them without causing offence. It didn't worry me that I might go too far. These guys love having their names mentioned and crave the limelight. One Sunday afternoon, someone let off a double barrel shotgun during the show. Both barrels. Bang, bang! Everyone hit the floor. Tony Scoggo and Tommy Scully were lying on the stage. I was hiding under a beer mat. The smoke slowly rose and gangsters were peering over the tops of tables. At the far end of the room, Tony Gallagher vaulted the bar, ran through all the tables and jumped on the stage. He grabbed the microphone. That's it. That's it. I've had enough. Shotguns in my club, is it? Well, from now on, nobody gets in without a bloody tie. The Columba was full again the next weekend. One of the most popular parts of the show every Sunday was the worst singing competition. The winner would get a teapot without a handle or maybe an old boot. During one particular show, I had a fella down the front who kept trying to get my attention. All right, come on then, you pillock, I said, giving him a clip around the back of the head as he climbed on the stage. Give us a bit of order for this dopey twat. He's going to give us a song. I handed him the microphone and he cleared his throat. In a big loud voice he announced, My name is Detective Inspector Coffey and this is a raid. Six policemen with clipboards under their arms came marching through the main door and down between the tables. There was a little fire escape at the side of the club, up about four stairs. It was only about two foot square. A hundred people went through that door in about seven seconds. They never got a single name, unless you count mine and Scoggo's. In the end, they tossed the clipboards on the bar and had a drink. Ricky Tomlinson, reading from his autobiography, Ricky. FM and the Book of the Week. Ricky Tomlinson, one of the country's best-loved comic actors, continues reading from his recent autobiography, Ricky, charting the circuitous route by which he became a household name. In today's episode, he takes part in the 1972 National Building Strike and gets arrested. In 1972, the two biggest building unions called Britain's first national building strike. The aim was to secure the minimum wage within the industry, as well as rigid enforcement of safety regulations and the outlawing of the lump, the unlicensed cowboys who didn't pay taxes and didn't train apprentices. I was working on the Wrexham bypass 
and became a member of the Wrexham Strike Action Committee. We met regularly at a pub in Chester called the Bull and Stirrup, where we hired a room upstairs. Flying pickets became our most effective tactic. We could spread the message by hitting as many sites as possible, talking to the workers and trying to convince them to join us. At the regular meetings of the strike committee, I became friendly with lads like Desi Warren, Ken O'Shea, John Carpenter, John Mackenzie Jones, the treasurer, and John Cluich. At one of our regular meetings on the 31st of August 1972, we discussed picketing in the Shrewsbury area. We voted to organise a big picket for the following week, with coaches bringing building workers from the surrounding districts. On the morning of the 6th of September, I boarded the coach from Wrexham. We all looked like extras from our Buidasane pet, dressed in donkey jackets and duffel coats, with sandwiches in our pockets and flasks of tea. Coaches also arrived from Chester, Flint and Prestatin, about 200 pickets in all. Although it may have looked disorganised to an outsider, the picketing was good-natured and effective. Flying pickets were lawful and we were escorted by police to all but one of the sites. Afterwards, a senior policeman, Chief Superintendent Meredith, shook hands with Desi and me, congratulating us on a peaceful picket. Three months after the strike ended, two detectives arrived at the bypass and started asking me questions about the day we picketed the sites around Shrewsbury and Telford. What's all this about, I asked. We have reason to believe that certain things were done which were untoward, and we'd like your help to get those responsible. We'd like you to be a prosecution witness. How can I be a prosecution witness? I was one of the strike committee. The detectives glanced at each other and then suggested that because of my political background, they thought I might be interested in helping them. I was briefly a member of the National Front in my youth. This has generated some harsh criticism, particularly from right-wing columnists and commentators in the media. I can't quite work out if they're angry with me for joining the NF or abandoning the right. I can't change my history and I'm not about to run away from it. I believed in certain things in 1968 and I don't believe in them anymore. I was politically naive and poorly educated. I told the detectives, we're just building workers. Politics have nothing to do with it. That's unfortunate. The whole conversation had been so surreal, I wanted to laugh. We had done nothing wrong. I had seen more hostility at Kitty's Christmas parties. A few weeks later, at home in the council house, I had a visit from the same two detectives just after tea. They read me my rights and escorted me to a Black Mariah. Similar vans were going round the other houses, picking up members of the strike committee. The following morning, we were taken to court to be officially charged. A conviction of conspiracy could see us jailed for life. It was ludicrous. We weren't militants. We were ordinary hairy ass building workers. The press had a field day when the charges became public knowledge. We were labelled as thugs and criminals. The Sunday people wrote that Desi was getting so much on the dole that he drove a Jaguar and had a colour TV. I'm not having this, I told myself. If this story's right, there'll be murder. I drove up to see Desi. He had a battered old Jaguar in his front yard that hadn't moved in two years. Several litters of kittens had been born on the back seat. His so-called colour TV was a black and white set with a coloured filter over the front which turned everything green. I felt guilty about doubting him. Morris Drake QC made his opening address on Wednesday the 3rd of October 1973. Using emotive language he painted a picture of a rampaging mob tearing things apart, knocking down walls, terrifying workers. We were like an Apache horde he said, hell bent on destruction. To our horror, the police who followed us to the building sites gave evidence to that effect. When asked in the witness box why he had thanked us for the peaceful picket, Chief Superintendent Meredith admitted shaking Desi's hand. I didn't know he was a criminal then, he explained. Desi was brilliant under cross-examination. Modest Drake tried to portray him as a violent thug, but Desi countered him with humour. At one point, 
Drake had rattled off a list of claims, each one prefaced with the phrase, Might I suggest, Mr. Warren? Desi looked at him and said saucily, You are very suggestive, Mr. Drake. The whole courtroom erupted, and Drake's face turned pink. I remember being nervous as I took the stand. Morris Drake did his smiling assassin act. You were all shouting, kill, 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 he said. You deliberately set out to intimidate these men. You were going to batter them into submission. I used to take my lad Clifton on the pickets, I responded. Do you really expect someone to take a toddler along? If blokes are raging around shouting, kill, kill, kill. I spent three days answering questions, but didn't waver. John Platts Mills QC defending us argued that the overwhelming evidence was that we had planned a peaceful picket. For 98 years, no government has thought fit to bring a charge of this sort, he said. Justice Mays thrust his finger at Platts Mills. This is an ordinary criminal trial. And it was an ordinary trade union meeting, yet my client is now charged with conspiracy, the QC responded. Platts Mills stood his ground until he was ordered to withdraw the remark which he did after throwing his wig on the bench in disgust. All six of us were found guilty of unlawful assembly. Desi, myself and Mackie were guilty of a fray. The jury couldn't reach a majority verdict on the four remaining charges of conspiracy. I felt as though a fist had been driven into my stomach. Justice May sent the jury to a hotel for the night while the six of us were taken to jail. I had never spent a night behind bars. Every sound seemed magnified and the air had a coldness that wasn't just about the temperature. The next morning, the jury foreman looked unhappy as he announced the verdicts. John Cluick was not guilty of conspiracy, but myself, Desi and Mackie were guilty. I was allowed to make a statement to the jury. It was said by Gorbals in the last war that if you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes accepted as the truth. This I have observed put into practice in this court and now know it to be true. I have heard the judge say this was not a political trial, but just an ordinary criminal case. I refute this with every fibre of my being. There was applause from the public gallery and calls of hear, hear. Justice Mays hammered his gavel and threatened to clear the court if there was another outburst. Desi spoke with power and passion. He told the court that there had indeed been a conspiracy, but not by the pickets. The conspiracy was one between the Home Secretary, the employers and the police. It was conceived after pressure from Tory MPs who demanded changes in picketing laws. There is your conspiracy. Justice Mace called for order and delivered the sentences. He denied that we were martyrs and rejected completely any suggestion that the trial had been politically motivated. John Carpenter, Ken O'Shea and John Cluick were given nine months suspended sentences. Mackie was sentenced to nine months in jail and I was given two years. There was an audible gasp from the court. Suddenly, the foreman of the jury stood up in disgust and pushed his way out of the jury box. Disgraceful, he muttered. Another juror in the front row also rose to his feet and walked out. Both men had to be persuaded to come back because Desi still hadn't been sentenced. The judge described Desi as vicious and arrogant before he sentenced him to three years jail. They shone a torch down my gob, made me strip naked, checked me hair for lice and handed me a prison uniform. I spent that first night in a holding cell shared with Desi and Mackie. I wrote a letter to Marlene before they turned off the lights and plunged us into a darkness that was deeper than any I had ever known. Early in January, Mackie was transferred to an open prison. At the same time, Desi and I were transferred to Stafford Jail. Stafford was most memorable for actually making me miss Shrewsbury. It was ancient and fallen apart, a real pig hole. I was taken to a single cell, number 37, ground floor, Crescent, D-Wing. The only window, high up on the wall, had tiny glass squares with many of them missing or broken. The wind whistled through the gaps, making it too cold to sleep. Finally, I had no choice but to use the telegrams and letters of support that had been arriving every day to plug the gaps. It broke my heart. 
I managed to fall asleep and woke up just before dawn. I shifted and suddenly the whole floor began to move. It was a mass of cockroaches. The cell was infested. I screamed the place down and hammered on the door until the screws arrived. I'm not staying in here, I told them. You have to move me. But a few cockroaches, one of them scoffed. The cell was just next to the kitchens and the cockroaches were breeding in the warmth and invading the cells. My bedding was crawling with parasites. They didn't move me for days. Three and a half thousand people marched through the streets of London on Tuesday, the 15th of January, to demonstrate at the sentences. Similar protests were held in Liverpool, Edinburgh and Teesside. Desi and I tried to stay out of trouble, but it was hard keeping quiet when conditions were so bad and the sense of injustice at our confinement burned so strongly in both of us. On the 28th of February, we asked to see the assistant governor. We're not happy with the conditions or the way the inmates are treated, I told him. We want to be transferred to an open prison and to be granted political status. He began mumbling about due process and regulations, but I interrupted. To show our determination, we have started a hunger strike. Giving up food wasn't such a huge sacrifice. Most of it I wouldn't have fed to the pigs. We were taken to the hospital block and put in different cells. A pipe and hot meal arrived, but remained uneaten. At one point, the doctor came in and said, you may as well tuck in. Warren's been eaten for the last three days. He had told Desi the same thing. Neither of us believed him. Fearing for our health, the protesters took a vote and then appealed for us to end the hunger strike. Later that day, a telegram arrived from the House of Commons. The assistant governor already knew the contents when he brought it to me. You're supposed to start eating, he said. No, I want to see Desi first. They let us meet in the hospital courtyard. I had a blanket over my head with a hole cut in the middle, just like a poncho. I was naked underneath. My hair was well past my shoulders and my beard was halfway down my chest. Desi was already in the yard when I arrived. He looked OK, although his hair was the colour of a battleship. He took one look at me and said, Crikey, it's Ben Gunn. We embraced each other and shuffled around the yard. So, what's the story, he asked. We've got to come off. OK, when? We'll make it in 48 hours. Desi nodded and scratched his unshaven chin. He stared up at the grey sky. Hey, Rick, I couldn't wish to have done time with anybody else. I had to turn away to hide my eyes. It was one of the finest compliments I had ever been paid. Our hunger strike ended on the 22nd day. Ricky Tomlinson was reading from his autobiography, Ricky.